As you are no doubt aware, the world has felt that there was a great suffering inflicted upon Jesus Christ. And because of this, the teaching has been lost in that area. Every time Jesus Christ is slapped or tortured or pierced with a sword, the world says, look what he's doing for us. I hope we can now come past the point where we feel that the Christ is a physical being so that we can clear that away sufficiently to see what is being taught to us by the sufferings of Jesus Christ. The message here at this point enables us to remove those levels of karma of which we are unconscious. You will see that every slap, every lashing, every humiliation is intended to show you that in the unconscious mind of you, in the world mind that functions through you, this is what is being done to the Christ. This is the universal lashing of the Christ. And even though we are not conscious of it, we are all permitting this violation of divine law within ourselves until and unless we consciously do something about it. And so the great method of bringing this to our attention is first you remember there's John the Baptist and he says the one who follows me is preferred before me his shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose and we all thought he meant Jesus Christ and he does at one level of the teaching but what he actually means is that the one who follows him is his own spiritual self first his physical self and then the one who follows him is his spiritual self he's talking about the second self of John the Baptist we have all thought he meant Jesus Christ but he's saying no first comes physical man and then comes spiritual man the first self and the second self now I want you to look at this this is a magnifying glass. And I want you to see that all the light comes down through the top. And this would be the light of the world. The light of the world streaming through the top. Rays of light. And because this is a certain kind of a glass turning a certain way, all of these rays of light then are pointed to each other when they come out at the other side of the glass. And so that above, their individual rays of light, and down below, they're all combined. And all of the light coming through is pointed to one specific point. And now if you change that, you see that all the light comes down through the top, and then the concavity of the glass points all the light in one direction, and conceivably, if the light were in patterns the magnifying glass would point all the light and form a figure and I want you to see then that above the glass is the unformed light and below the glass is the formed light above the glass is the light which is invisible and below the glass is the visible light spirit coming through mind is formed into the appearance called matter above is the pure light below is the formed light but the pure light never ceases to be pure so that all the light above the glass is always pure light and the figures 
the forms, the objects made by that light as it passes through the mind, which here is the, the glass, become forms. But the forms are only in the mind as the light comes through them. So these would be the two firmaments, the above and below. Now bear that in mind. We have the glass, the magnifying glass, or we have the world mind, which is the magnifying glass, and above it is the reality of spirit, below it is the concepts of the world mind. The above firmament could be called the Christ consciousness or the fourth dimension of consciousness and the below could be called this world consciousness or material consciousness. Always the pure light is pure. What the mind does in its concepts about it does not change the light. And so the mind receiving the light throws forth projected images. Above is my kingdom. Below is this world. John the Baptist, appearing in this world, says, the one who follows me is preferred before me, meaning I appearing to you now in physical form in this world am not that self which is complete. There is a real self here which is an invisible self which is in my kingdom of pure light. And I, John the Baptist, am going to make way for a second self. And that second self will be John the Baptist reborn to his original self of pure light. The first self below must make way for what appears to be the second self, but is really the self that is above. The self of you above is buried in this mortal consciousness as you come into form and now the form must make way for the self of you above and so you must return to your original self. The returning to your original self appears to be a rebirth to a second self. It is a return to your original. John the Baptist is making way for his second self. But this is a message for everyone, that the first self in form must make way for the second self in form. And the second self will be the divine image made visible. Now along comes Jesus Christ. And his birth is totally different than your birth and my birth. It's different in the sense that he is born not to the first self. He has already passed that stage in previous reincarnations. In this one, he is born through the pure consciousness, so that he is not only a form, but he is actually life itself. Life comes into appearance, and this life is the second self, and it is also the first self at the same time because it is born of a pure consciousness which is not a consciousness of form but a consciousness of life. It is born of a consciousness of Mary which is pure at heart or virginal, knowing the Father aright. And so in this appearance comes a second self which is also the first self which is also the original self. And it is able to show the power of that original self. It has complete mastery over all flesh, over all nature, over all matter. It has mastery over human life. It has mastery over all world powers. And it demonstrates that it has this mastery. And we watch it. And we see the Christ within a cripple, relieving that cripple of the concept of being crippled. We see the Christ within a blind man, removing the concept of blindness. We see that the Christ within 
represented by the outer Christ of Jesus, is always able to dominate matter completely. And now after establishing this mastery over matter, we come to a phase of the Christ demonstration which is totally different. Now the Christ, having established that I have total dominion over matter, will now show you about the reason for your suffering in the world. I will make visible to you the causes of your own suffering. I who have mastery over matter can submit to matter, letting it appear to master me, knowing that it cannot. And therefore I will draw out of matter that which is hidden to human sense. And so Christ walks the earth drawing out of matter what we call lashings and beatings and torture and crucifixion only to reveal the invisible nature of our adversary. There is no physical Christ to undergo this torture. And so let's not be squeamish about it now as we come into scourgings. Let us see that the human below is unaware of the nature of his problem. And the Christ which has shown mastery over the world now wishes to reveal the nature of the human problem in another way. He's going to reveal the activity of world mind in man of which man is unaware. You are not aware, for example, that you are lashing the Christ. You are not aware that you are smiting the Christ. You are not aware that you are crucifying the Christ. You are not aware that you are committing suicide. And the Christ is going to show us that we are all, as mortal beings, daily committing suicide. And the ingenious method is almost incredible. A form is placed in the world and there's no person in that form. There's no person there to suffer. There's no person there in any way to shed one drop of blood. And that none person which appears as form draws out of the world all of its hate, all of its animosity, all of its hypocrisy to show the world just what is happening inside every individual on the earth even though the individuals on the earth have no knowledge of this unconscious, involuntary inner activity of the world mind which makes them individually do within themselves to the Christ of their own being precisely what the Christ is making us do outside in the visible, visible lashing and crucifix crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The outer is being a mirror to the inner so that you will know how the inner workings of the mortal mind are. And every time a hand reaches out and slaps the Christ you are being told that mortal mind in you is doing that now in ways you know not of. And every time you slap the Christ within you, even though you are unaware of it, you're committing suicide. You're inflicting wounds upon yourself. So let us remember, the mirror is the outer Jesus Christ to reveal the invisible activity going on in the world mind which functions in each of us as a human mind to alert us that we must step out of that area below and be reborn of the area above that unless we stop slapping the Christ crucifying the Christ piercing the Christ knowingly consciously specifically we will continue to fall into the trap and we will not benefit by what he is revealing. 
Now Pilate, undecided, is trying to shift responsibility. The mind and the body each take turns denying the Christ. The intellect and its body which it uses each turn away from the Christ because they're both controlled by the world mind. The world mind and you controlling your mind unless you're Christ conscious therefore controls your body. And so Pilate, the material power, is torn between many forces. Pilate, therefore, took Jesus and scourged him. That's a lashing. But there is no physical Christ. Now, who was scourged? Christ is spirit. The whole teaching is that I am the light. How do you scourge the light? The deception then is that mortal mind in us makes us by our unawareness of Christ within scourge that Christ. When you are unaware of Christ within, you are lashing the Christ. You see, you don't have to take a whip and strike somebody. It's the unawareness of Christ within you which is the lashing. Just when Christ said, give me to drink, unless you are aware of the living waters of Christ, you're not giving Christ to drink. Unless you are aware of the Christ, you're lashing the Christ. Pilate is unaware of the Christ of his own being. And because of it, that appears outwardly as him lashing the outer visible, Jesus Christ. He thinks there's a Jesus Christ there and the world has thought so. And he lashes out. He has the Christ scourged. But that represents what he's doing to Christ within himself. Because he doesn't know he is doing it, he is doing it. It represents what all physical might in the world is doing to Christ within. When we send a collective army somewhere, we are all lashing the Christ within ourselves. And you must take yourself out of that because that is a collective karma. And we suffer from it. All of our sufferings have to do with the denial of the Christ within every individual. For instance, if somebody hurts somebody else, you may think you're not suffering what you are because the hurt that they have perpetrated on another isn't from them to that person it's from the world mind in them and that same world mind that you do not see in them is also doing it in you to the Christ every time another individual on earth denies the Christ the world mind in you is doing the same and so you must consciously be aware that Christ is your identity that's the only way world karma does not hit the individual. Otherwise, the individual is part of world karma. And all of the suffering we go through is largely the world karma which we suffer from plus that individual karma which we have earned by our own individual ignorance of Christ. Everything is geared on are you in Christ or not? Are you in spirit or not? And if you're not, even though you're good, you're sharing, you're humanly a fine person, the same world mind functions in you denying the Christ anyway, and you're in violation of divine law without even knowing about it. Now Jesus Christ, through being able to draw out upon this image called Christ all of the hate and venom of the world is revealing what is in the world mind and those who have no awareness of what he is doing think that he is suffering from the cruelty of mankind he's not suffering from their cruelty and they're not being cruel 
He is pointing out to you the real hidden adversary. It is not Pilate, it is not the Jew. The Jews aren't cruel to Jesus Christ. Pilate isn't cruel to Jesus Christ. The world mind is the Jew and the world mind is Pilate. The Jew doesn't say crucify him. Pilate doesn't say crucify him. The rabble doesn't say crucify him. World mind in Pilate says it. World mind in the Jew. World mind in the rabble says it. He's telling you who your adversary is. And if it wasn't the Jew, it would be another. If it wasn't Pilate, it would be another. If it wasn't the rabble, it would be another. The world mind wears every face in every form. To agree with your adversary, you must see that Christ is making your adversary commit visible acts so that you will understand that these people who allegedly are crucifying Christ, they're as much a victim as the one they consider their victim. They are victims of the world mind. And now watch, every time someone attacks the Christ in some way, it's as if Christ were holding up a sign and saying, now watch carefully, this is what's happening in you. See him hit me? Now watch this sign, it says, just as he's hitting me now, in you, you, by your ignorance of my presence, you are hitting me. He's alerting us. You put this crown of thorns in my head and this purple robe on my shoulder and you mock me? No, that isn't you mocking me. That's the world mind which mocks the Christ. How much longer will you let that world mind run your affairs? That's what he's saying. And so now this is the reverse. First he showed his power over all mankind to raise people back to life, to tame storms, to remove diseases. Now he shows why we don't do it. We don't do it because we have not come to our Christhood. And when we're not in our Christhood, it's because the world mind in us is separating us from our Christhood. And we can never come to our Christhood as long as we do not recognize the world mind in us. That's what's going on now in this chapter. Universal world mind is where the problems of the world are. This magnifying glass with a light above it and then the forms beneath it formed out of the light, this magnifying glass is the world mind. It reinterprets the light of God into the forms that we call matter. So we see through that glass darkly. That which is below, that which is human, is not there. There is nothing below. There is nothing in the world mind that is. All that is, is the pure light. There is no pilate. There is no Jew. There is no Gentile. There is no material selfhood. There is only the pure light of God. And so he wants us not to fight the wrong enemies. And so you find Jesus Christ completely unmoved by all these forms. Pilate can't understand why a man can be so calm in the face of a vicious attack, so strong, so unafraid. And it's because the Christ is actually God. What else is Christ but God individualized? Do you think that God was being beaten up? It's a teaching on the vast screen of time and space for you and I to understand what is happening within our consciousness. The only way you can pur purify your consciousness is to understand what is happening in the invisible nature of the world mind. To understand its methods of deception. 
to see that the world mind makes all that appears to you as form. Above the glass is the pure light, but below the glass comes the experience we call birth. The light is never born. Is God ever born? Can the Spirit of God be born if it already is? Are you the Spirit? The birth that takes place below never happens. It seems to happen. The pure light is always there, and that is why after the birth of the form, a John the Baptist must, be, must say, he who follows me is greater than I, preferred above me. He who cometh after me is preferred before me. You must learn to say that. The form that I came into is not the light of my being, but the light of my being, which came, which was first, is preferred. I am not the form, I am that light, that life. And so I must rise out of the belief in birth and form. <coughs> and I cannot do that while this world mind in me makes me continue to believe that I am form, that I was born into form, that I will die in form. And the Christ is saying, now watch carefully how world mind is going to act. It's even going to crucify me, who loves God supremely. And it's going to say to you, he's going to say to you, it's going to do the same to you that it did to me. If it's going to crucify the one who is the great teacher of the world, what do you think it's going to do to you? World mind in you is going to bury you. That's what it's going to do. Unless you are aware of how it works. He's teaching you that world mind in everyone births us and then commits suicide, killing us. And we let it happen because we're not aware that that is what is happening. We call it death. It isn't. It's world mind dropping its concept which it conceived as birth. World mind exerting powers that do not exist. And the answer is always to find that capacity in you which is the light of the world, which is the second self. And that salvation is not by faith in God, but by faith in spiritual identity, your spiritual identity. Once you have faith in your spiritual identity, then you have the secret of salvation, which is to be reborn from the lower to the upper, to be born from above. I, says the Christ, am from above. You are from below. You are the formed light. I am the unformed light, the undifferentiated light. I am the infinite light. And to be born from above, you must accept your infinite identity. You must overcome the falsifications of the invisible world mind in you. Now everything the world mind here is going to do to Jesus Christ in the visible, the world mind is now doing to everyone in the invisible mind of their own being. Daily, the Christ is being crucified by our actions. And unless we stop it, the world mind will bury us. It buried our parents. It buried everybody who has ever walked this earth. Whoever has been born into this world has been buried by the world mind. And whoever wants to step out like Enoch or John or Moses or Jesus Christ has to step out of the world mind which is that functioning body of thought in them 
And when they step out of it, the lashings stop, the torches stop, the suffering stops. They were all unnecessary. They existed only in the world below, never in my kingdom, never in Christ. All suffering on earth, he is pointing out, is illusory and unnecessary. Every minute of suffering you have ever undergone has been unnecessary. It has happened only because of the unawareness of the nature of error, which is universal world mind, and the nature of God, which is Christ, the substance of your true being. Now, you don't come from below and go up. You rise in Christ consciousness. And as your Christ consciousness rises, you find the magnifying glass disappears. The world mind is obliterated. It has no power in you. And you break all the seven veils. Christ in you breaks the veil of time, the veil of space, the veil of form, the veil of matter, the veil of motion, the veil of human will, and the veil of human ego the complete human personality which is only world mind in a disguise is broken and death becomes an impossibility now we're going to deepen with this understanding of Christ here once we have eliminated the personalized human belief that Jesus Christ is going through a great torture chamber this is the inner activity of your consciousness that is being described. The soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe. So we have the thorns on his head, the purple robe. We know they're mocking, of course, but world mind is always mocking the Christ. The crown of thorns we know that in order to come to the crown, you must first come to the cross. We know the thorns are necessary. We know we must go through the thorns in order to receive the crown. You see, here, these people are the actors, even though they themselves are unaware of it. Many people come into your life and have very little apparent function spiritually and yet they are used in some way by spirit someone will drop a book you need someone will do something else they have no intention of doing these things other than that spirit has brought them to your doorstep in one way or another and here the rabble the soldiers Pilate and the Jews are the actors what they do, they cannot help. I have here a little passage. This is from the Gospel of Nicodemus. It's the apocryphal gospel. It's also called the Acts of Pilate. Pilate is speaking privately in this gospel to Jesus. And he says, What shall I do with thee? And Jesus says, Do as it hath been given thee. And Pilate says, How hath it been given? And Jesus says, well, the prophets foretold concerning my death and resurrection. The point is, the Jews had to crucify Jesus. Pilate had to crucify Jesus. Jesus had to be crucified to reveal the non-power of the world the non-reality of the world, the illusory nature of the human form and of the material objects of the world. It was a teaching. And the beautiful and magnificent part of the teaching is that we do not understand that for that teaching to come into our experience visibly, there had to be an intelligence bringing it to us. A great infinite force putting on the screen of time and space a teaching 
to tell us not to stop at the level of form. Man wants to stay at that level. Man loves that level. He wants to be successful. He wants to survive as a fleshly creature. He wants to perpetuate his own incompleteness, even though he doesn't realize that's what he's trying to do. And the infinite spirit is saying to us, don't stop at that level. You must go beyond form. You must be born from above, from the light. The second self must replace the first self. That which come, came before you must now come after the form. You must return to the original self. And the mind of man struggles against this, and so it scourges the Christ. It says, I want to remain a physical creature. And the soldiers, the servants of material power, they mock the Christ. The soldiers within us mock the Christ, put a crown on its head, raising human intelligence above God. Human wisdom is rated higher than divine wisdom. And the purple robe, another sign of mockery, human wisdom is rated above divine. Human righteousness is rated above divine righteousness. You see how Pilate represents all the physical force of the world. And the Jews represent all of the pseudo-spiritual force of the world. Who is higher in spiritual awareness than the Jews? Nobody. Who is higher in physical might than Rome? Nobody. You take the two great forces of the world, the so-called religious power, the so-called physical power, and Christ is showing that neither of them know God. Neither of them know identity. Something greater has to come. And only John the Baptist gives us the clue at the beginning. He who follows me is greater than I. His shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. Only Christ can reconcile the conflicts of the world. And then the great physical power of Pilate Rome, the great religious power of Judaism, both are totally rejected by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ rejects Judaism. Jesus Christ rejects Rome. As great as both are supposed to be, only the invisible child of God is present. The visible power of Rome and the religious power of Judaism are both non-existent. They are world mind disguised. They are both antichrist. All of the powers in the world that ever will be in the human world on a physical level are represented by Pilate. And all of the religions in the world that ever will be are represented by Judaism. The highest represents them all, and the highest represents them all. Both cases represent the allness of all the religions and all of the physical might. And we are being told that we are independent of these forces. They will always lash out at the Christ. They will think their righteousness is correct. Their power is insurmountable. And they are not what they appear to be. They are the world mind which in us is doing that very same thing. The adversary has beautifully disguised himself as Judaism and as religion, as armies, as nations going off to war, defending democracy. That's still world mind. You can't go off to defend democracy. You can't go off to kill anything. Only world well mind does that.
Now then, we have our adversaries identified, whether it's Jew or non-Jew, whether it's religion or whether it's science, or whether it's any form of government. Anything that believes in matter is world mind posing as that which believes in matter. We cannot have a material world formed of good anything or bad anything. There are no good religions, there are no bad religions. There is no material world. There's no good power and there's no bad power. There is no power. There is only the pure spirit, the pure light of God present. And that's all that is in this world. The invisible light of God is all that is present. All the rest is the screen on which the concepts of world mind appear. And only a Jesus Christ who is actually God itself and who is God itself in you shows you how to walk through this screen of concepts knowing that there's no substance or power there not being fooled by the material concepts that appear as form, not reaching out to get that which perishes, showing here the non-power of Judaism over the Christ, the non-power of Rome over the Christ, and therefore the non-power of the world over the Christ in you. Christ in you becomes salvation. Hail, king of the Jews, say the rabble, and they smote him with their hands. All human thoughts, whether they're good thoughts or bad thoughts, are turning away from the Christ. They are not the thoughts of God, are they? And so all human thoughts are smiting the Christ. When they smite him with their hands, this is not them smiting the Christ. This is human thought automatically mocking the Christ. All human thought, which is an automatic turning away from divine thought, is mocking the Christ. Take no thought. Because when you take thought, you are mocking the Christ. And when you take thought, when you do not do something consciously to step out of human thought, you are building your karma. And so while we continue blissfully to ignore Christ consciousness, thinking, well, we can put it off for another hour or day or month, or that life will go on, things will happen well anyway, whether I do something or not, while we're doing that, the karma within is building. You see how our inertia permits karma to build up even while we think we're worshiping God? That's how important these few phrases here are. They smite the Christ with their hands. When you do nothing about knowing God, you are harming yourself, even though you're not aware of it. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. You can even say, well, What am I doing that's wrong? I've not done anything that is faulty, I haven't stolen, I haven't lied, I haven't cheated, I've been friendly to people, what have I done that's wrong? And even while you're doing these nice things, you're building negative karma and don't know it. 
When you're not one with Christ, you're building negative karma. And so you may have led a beautiful life for 60 years in which you did all the right things that people think are right and built negative karma while you were doing it and can't figure out why at a certain time you go through certain sufferings. And so we're jolted again and again and again out of our complacency that just being good isn't enough. And that religion cannot just satisfy the spirit of God by teaching people how to be good human beings. It isn't enough. They must be the Christ. And when we're not being the Christ, we're crucifying the Christ by not being the Christ. These are the self-inflicted wounds that you have permitted yourself to undergo even though you were unaware, even though you thought you were such a good person. And this would go on again and again through more reincarnations unless the meaning of the Christ message is clearly pointed out, that this is what the Christ is doing at this juncture, not suffering, not being self-tortured, but bringing to light that which is happening in the invisible world mind. Now you take a psychologist who probes the mind. He's not aware that Christ is the greatest psychologist of all time. For Christ shows you that the mind which you're probing is the cause of everything that is of a material nature the cause of both birth and death and the false lifespan in between. Christ just takes that mind and turns it inside out and says, look at it. Don't probe this corner or that corner. Look at it. This is the murderer in our midst, smiling at you in one way while killing you in another. And so this teaching has been lost to the masses. It's too difficult a teaching. You can't tell it to normal people. They won't understand. They won't know what to do when they do find out about it. It'll only perplex them and frustrate them. But mortal mind is the person you're looking at. There's not a person you see who isn't mortal mind made visible. That's what persons are. And where person appears and mortal mind is making that person appear, when you step out of mortal mind in you, you become conscious of the invisible Christ where the person had seemed to be. You still see that person, but you feel with the inner soul sense the presence of something beside a person you no longer hold them in the tomb of a body. And while the rabble, the Jews, Pilate, and the soldiers are hating this which they call Jesus Christ, Christ is loving them. Christ is not holding them in bondage to physical form. Christ is, Christ is not seeing them as an enemy. Christ has no human enemies. Christ knows only the one adversary, the world mind, and isn't fooled by the physical disguises. Similarly, if there were lack of limitation, Christ wouldn't be fooled by those disguises. They too are the world mind. Every evil on this earth, whatever its name or nature, is the same one world mind. And when you lick it, you've licked all the evil there is. And you only lick it by accepting spiritual identity. And until you do, world mind will complete, completely devastate your life in one way or another because it is the nature of world mind to continue to lead us into committing all forms of violation of divine law. 
until we accept the Spirit of God as our own being. It's only when we do that the world mind loses its power to manipulate us, to torment us, to deceive us, and to present things to us that are not true and have us accept them as if they were true. And so the plan is that Jesus Christ is revealing world mind as the only oppressor, the only place where problems exist. And that world karma continues and that this karma continues whether you're aware of it or not, whether you voluntarily contribute to it or not. And it only stops when you consciously seek, ask, knock at the door of your own Christ within yourself. When you accept that here stands no mortal being, that is how you defeat the world mind. Here stands what you have called a mortal being only because you've been looking out from the eyes of mortality. But invisibly, the child of God stands where you are. And that child of God is the light which you know when you're in the upper firmament of consciousness. Then there are no lashings, there are no beatings, there are no torches, there are no diseases, there are no misgivings, there are no oppressions, there are no lacks, no limitations. Once you have accepted the light as your name, you may go through the period of thorns and thistles, but the light will take you through them safely, effortlessly. Now then, as he was able to look at the Jews and Pilate and the soldiers without hate, later saying, forgive them, they know not what they do, he was acknowledging only the presence of God. He was demonstrating that this that you see is not the true picture. He was demonstrating that only God is present. The allness of God. He was demonstrating that one who knows that only God is present is the majority. One with God is a majority. He was demonstrating that I, the living spirit of God, am the only self that is present. There are no Jews, no Pilate, no Roman Empire. There's no pain, there's no suffering. This is the illusion of the world mind the knowledge of good and of evil. It isn't present. And just as it wasn't present at that moment in that day, it isn't present in this moment in this day. There is no lack. There is no limitation. There is no famine. There is no overpopulation or underpopulation. There is no war. There is no Pilate today. There is no dictator today. There is no Jew today. There's no non-Jew today. There are not 25 or 85 religions on the earth today. They're all mortal mind wearing its many disguises. All that is here today is what was demonstrated there in that day. And that is the invisible God. That's all that is present in this room and on this earth. Only God is present. And all of this that happens, therefore, is finally shown to have had no effect whatsoever. It only seems to happen, and the corpse is not a corpse. It never happened, that's why. The illusory nature of the mortal world, the illusory nature of the mortal body, the illusory nature of mortal conditions, is the revelation that only God is present. And where God is, is holy ground. And the place where I now standest is therefore holy ground because God is present there. 
and the invisible name of God is Christ in you. Until this is accepted, invisible world mind continues, birthing us and then killing us. Christ in you is the very same Christ that is making this demonstration of Christ on the cross. Jesus Christ is healed of mortality. Jesus Christ is healed of the belief in the power of the world. Healed of the belief in the existence of anything unlike the Spirit of God. But the world mind, acting as the various forms that continue to beleaguer him, show forth that which is in the world mind, the hate, the distortion. And this continues in each of us even though we don't share in the outward physical beating of the Christ. To be forewarned enables you to do something about it. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said unto him, Behold the man. He was really playing to their sense of pity. He didn't want to crucify Christ, and yet he did. He didn't know what to do. This was a hot potato. We learn in Matthew that the wife of Pilate was a sort of student of Jesus Christ, Claudia. We learn in Matthew that she said to Pilate, don't have anything to do with this man's death. I had a terrible dream, and I suffered a great deal in my dream because of him. In some way or another, she had become aware of him as a force. And Pilate didn't really know what to believe anymore. Maybe this man was a very special, privileged man. He didn't know. He just wanted to get rid of the whole thing and now he's hoping that when they look at this sorry figure they will have some compassion and say, well, let him go. He's had enough punishment. But mortal mind, you must remember, is writing the whole script here. It's being forced to show forth its contents. They won't have any of that. When the chief priests, therefore, and others saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. The chief priests are saying, Crucify him. This was then the greatest religion on the earth, saying, Crucify him. This was the religion that had in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill, saying, Crucify him. Do you see how mortal mind poses as religion, makes its own laws, turns upon itself? And this is the ugly nature of mortal mind in us. Pilate says, take him and crucify him. I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, we have a law. By our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Well, let's look at their law. You'll find it in Leviticus. You'll find it in Deuteronomy.
In Leviticus 24.16, here is the Judaic law about attitudes toward God. He that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well as a stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. Put to death. And yet it said stoning, not crucifixion. Now in Deuteronomy, we have a little further discussion on that. The 13th chapter of Deuteronomy. The first verse says, If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and then we'll skip over to the 5th, And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. If this prophet then has all these signs and wonders that have something to do with blaspheming God he shall be put to death. And so it's in their law. And according to their law, Jesus blasphemed. Now specifically, here were the blasphemies he made. In John 5, the 18th verse, we have one of the blasphemies. Jesus answered them and said, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. And therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, thus making himself equal with God. Now when he said that God was his father, they interpreted that from their Leviticus and and Deuteronomy laws as being a blasphemy against God. 